Um, that's it. Good evening, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends, family. Uh, thank you very much for being here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nico Gijvan Petius. Uh, if my voice fades away, I'm, I had a three hour long uh, committee for postgraduate research this afternoon, so <laughs> lots of talking this afternoon. Um, I'm the Vice Dean for Research and Internationalization of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, and I would like to welcome you all this evening. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, a special word of welcome to uh, our Chief Operating Officer, Professor Stan Lupesi. Thank you for being here this evening. Professor Taryn Young, uh, the inaugural lecturer this evening. And Professor Young's um, uh, guests, uh, sp specifically her husband Dion, her children Gareth, Scott and Melissa, as well as family and friends who are also in attendance. Thank you very much for coming here uh, this evening. Also, all special guests from outside the university and colleagues from inside the university, this faculty, as well as Stellenbosch campus. So we uh, celebrate inaugural lectures in Stellenbosch University, but also in all universities worldwide. It's a very special event. We see it as a celebration and a, a time to uh, really um, celebrate the evening with the inaugural lecturer, because this is the time where the inaugural lecturer can tell us what they did uh, over many years, uh, their academic achievements, but also for those of us who are their colleagues and know the academic students, give, give a glimpse into who they are as a person. Uh, it is a special time for us, uh, a time of achievement, recognition, and um, we are very glad that you're all here this evening to share this with us, to share the event with uh, Professor Young. So I do hope you will enjoy the evening. I would like to hand over now to Professor Jimmy Volming, the Dean of our faculty, to please introduce the candidate. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, we are not, or any. It really gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Young, Taryn Young, to you this evening. Taryn Natalie Young <laughs> was born and grew up in the picturesque town of Franschuk which of course may account for her calm and pleasant demeanor. <laughs> As there were, at the time, no schools for people of color in Franschuk, she attended and completed her junior schooling at the Simondium Primary School near Paul. Her mother was a teacher at this school, and Taryn had the good fortune, or perhaps misfortune, of having her mother as her class teacher in grade five. <laughs> Taryn subsequently attended the Polis Joubert High School in Pau. This necessitated a three hour round trip by bus to and from Franschhoek every day. Her high school years commenced in 1986, which as some of you may recall, was a period of intense political unrest in, this, in the country. She nevertheless managed to successfully complete her schooling and was accepted for medicine at UCT, where she obtained an MBCHB degree in 1995. Taryn recalls two major challenges <clears throat> in her early days at UCT. The first was getting used to being taught in English. Didn't know that. Um, and the other was not having the financial means to be able to rent suitable accommodation. As a result, she had to travel from home in Franschhoek using train, bus, and taxi every day, Monday to Fridays, throughout most of her first year at medical school. Despite these early hurdles that had to be overcome, Taryn kept forging ahead. Critical in being able to do so was the support she received from her mother, whom she describes as her rock, as well as that of family and friends. Taryn went on to specialize in public health, obtaining her fellowship in 2002, 
and an MED degree in public health from UCT in 2003. She later completed a dissertation on teaching evidence-based healthcare for which she received a PhD in public health from Stellenbosch in 2015. Upon completion of her specialist qualifications, Taryn's professional career rapidly progressed and shifted from clinical medicine and hospital management to research. Substantive posts she has held include that of Senior Research Officer in the School of Public Health and Family Medicine at UCT, Senior Specialist Scientist and Deputy Director of the South African Cochrane Center at the MRC, Director of the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare at Stellenbosch, and HOD of the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics also at Stellenbosch. In 2013, she was appointed as Associate Professor and in 2017 as full professor. Professor Young's contributions to the health and higher education sectors have been numerous and significant. As founding program convener of our MSc in clinical epidemiology, she has nurtured the course into one of the most popular and successful programs at Stellenbosch. Since its inception in 2008, the MSc in Clinical Epi has graduated a total of 140 master's students, a large percentage of which have been students from beyond the borders of South Africa. Professor Young has also personally supervised more than 20 master's and doctoral students and guided a number of postdoctoral fellows. In addition, she carries a heavy undergraduate teaching load and has taught numerous short courses. Professor Young is an NRF rated researcher who has been successful in attracting major international research grants, who collaborates widely with colleagues in South Africa and abroad, and who has published over 80 peer reviewed journal articles. <coughs> she has also been inv an invited keynote speaker at a number of national and international conferences. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Young is an energetic and visionary leader and scholar who has made a significant contribution to advancing evidence-based healthcare. I'm therefore delighted to invite her to the podium to deliver her inaugural address. Thank you. It's fantastic to see so many smiling faces. It's not always the picture that you see when you stand in front of an undergraduate class. <laughs> so as Jimmy mentioned, for the past uh, 15 years, I've been devoting my work to evidence-based uh, healthcare or promoting evidence-informed practices. And in preparing this talk, I thought maybe it's a good opportunity to just share some of my learning over the journey the past 15 years. So if we think about making decisions in health and healthcare, we consider a lot of factors. We consider how much money we have, we consider uh, what's wrong with us, we consider what in terms of policies do we have available, we consider the expertise of the person providing care to us as well as our own values and preferences. But importantly, while you're doing that, it's important that you also need to consider research evidence to inform your decision making so that you know that the, whatever choices you're making is based on sound evidence. So when we're talking about promoting evidence-based health care, it's about promoting the use of rigorous research evidence in decision making. And I thought, let me reflect on, on how I've been involved in influencing the evidence ecosystem. So uh, Kenneth Wolf quite nicely put forward that if one reflects, uh, reflection is what allows us to learn from our experiences. It's an assessment of where we have been and where we want to go to next. 
So I thought let's start by reminding ourselves if we talk about the evidence ecosystem, let's first think about what is an ecosystem. And this is a beautiful picture that makes me want to go on holiday <laughs> of a coral reef ecosystem. And if you look in the dictionary, an uh, ecosystem is a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. Uh, it's dynamic, there's a lot of interaction and energy flows, and it's influenced by a lot of internal and external factors. So when we talk about the evidence ecosystem and specifically research evidence, there's typically three processes that involved. On the one hand, we have evidence generation, so that is where you do your own research. Then you have evidence synthesis, because often if you're doing, uh, looking at a particular question, there will be more than one research study that's been done on that same question. So you need to bring it together, and that will be evidence synthesis. And then you also get evidence translation, which is the promotion of the uptake of evidence in policy and practices. And this, uh, I tried initially to draw this interaction between these and I gave up because I thought the slide will just be too messy to, see, to show the, the interaction between evidence generation, synthesis and translation. But I think the most important thing is that this doesn't happen in a vacuum and it happens within the complex healthcare system context that's influenced by various factors and various issues. And importantly, we've got actors playing a role in evidence production, in evidence synthesis and translation, and those involved in the implementation of evidence. But importantly, all of us, when we work in the evidence ecosystem, we're doing it to improve health and health equity. So we have that common goal that we're working towards. So now I want to share with you a few of my experiences and what I've been doing, firstly, around conducting relevant research with good methods around the priority questions that we face within our continent. So when I started with the uh, South African Cochrane Center in 2004, one of the key activities that I actually had to do as part of my job description was to implement advanced training for novice authors of uh, systematic reviews, which is this type of research of bringing research together. Because at that stage, the focus for the center was mainly on awareness raising and there was an HIV program, but nothing for other types of reviews. So with uh, the Nuffield, a grant from the Nuffield Foundation, we Im implemented a program called the Reviews for Africa program, or in short, the RAP program. In 2008, we presented a poster on this at the international conference, and we said what three years in rapping, of rapping can do for you. And I can tell you this rapping really paid off. And Scott, don't worry, I'm not going to start rapping right now. <laughs> So as part of this program, we in, 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 uh, enrolled about 24 um, novice authors from the African region. You can see the distribution in the map that I've provided. They spent about four weeks with us on intensive protocol development. They went back home and they came back after about eight months for uh, support to complete their research. And we drew in colleagues like the late Professor Bongani Mayosi, we drew in Paul Garner from Liverpool, who we've been collaborating with as seasoned authors to come and facilitate the learning of these novice authors. And what has been fantastic is that those that we've trained are really championing the implementation of evidence-informed practices in the region. Some of them are involved in leading Cochrane Nigeria. Some of them are involved as peer reviewers and editors within Cochrane. Some of them are in involved at, at research institutions. So it's really been great to see how they have been paying it forward. Now moving on to setting up the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare at Stellenbosch University. We started talking about this in 2010. I remember I was accompanying Prof Farming to a workshop in, in Gauteng somewhere, and we started talking about what if there's a dedicated center for evidence-based practices within the faculty. And after about a year of various discussions and planning, the center was launched on August 2011. And the focus of the activities for the center has really been around three areas. 
to conduct research, to promote the uptake of that research and policy and practice, and to have various training initiatives um, that we implement to advance both the vision and the mission of the Centre for Evidence-Based Healthcare. And importantly, we want to be a centre of excellence um, on the African continent. And it's been an incredible journey. We're now eight years on, and it's amazing to reflect on the achievements of the centre. We've done research to inform World Health Organization guidelines. We've been at the forefront to develop methods for doing research and for sharing that and for getting others to be using that. We've been playing a key role with mentorship and support within the faculty and outside the faculty for novice authors. And I nearly fell off my chair when I counted how many peer-reviewed publications we've published since 2011. And the tally for the center alone is more than 350 publications. So that is, was really fantastic to do that count. I actually got Tracy to see, please just go and double check that I don't say this and it's wrong. <laughs> but I can confirm we check the evidence. So, so one of the things that has been a success factor for us to have such achievements is that we have a lot of projects. We are very clear with these projects around what we want to achieve. We explicit with our goals. And this particular project of the Effective Healthcare Research Consortium gives a very nice reflection on, on, on those approaches. Here we have explicit ob objectives to influence policy and practice. So we don't start research unless we have a finger on the pulse that this is a topic that, that policymakers would want the answer to. Importantly, we bring on board authors from low and middle income countries to get involved in these reviews and lead the reviews. We strive for excellence and we push this throughout and we provide bespoke capacity development opportunities to support the teams to be able to deliver it on time. But most importantly, we collaborate and we sit back and we decide for this particular piece of work what's the skills that we need and who can best come on board to make it happen. Importantly, as part of this project, we also realize that it's not just about increasing capacity for doing research, but we actually need to be increasing capacity for using research. So we've been running a lot of workshops and I'm just sharing a few of these photos with you in Tanzania, Malawi, Namibia, Kenya, within South Africa to actually build capacity of researchers to be able to make sense of existing research so that they can use that to identify the true gaps linked to research and then try to fill those gaps. In terms of the building capacity in clinical epidemiology, this is the master's program that Prof. Formig mentioned in the introduction. We started with this program intensive planning in 2007, so I came along when the structure or the plan was already in place and my main objective was to support the implementation of the program. Um, we've been drawing uh, applicants from all over the African region and at one stage we actually did an assessment of similar programs and found that there were only four such programs within the African region with our program being the second biggest program to build this particular capacity. So the, the students spend it's, uh, quite a bit of time with us, about two to three years to complete the program and it's really fantastic and I think for me the best moment is to see them graduate. It is wonderful to be at the graduation ceremony and see them walk across the stage and there they're graduating. I think it's even better when we see them publishing their research and more than 50 of our students have published their research in peer-reviewed journals. And I think for me the best thing is actually to see how they then pay it forward. Because these students are head of uh, research institutions or units. They are head of clinical departments where they're fostering evidence-informed practices. Um, one of uh, our colleagues that can't be here tonight is actually going very recently to the Cochran Colloquium where she's going to be co-facilitating with one of our heads of uh, departments that's, that's in the audience a course on how to train the trainers to facilitate learning in evidence-based practices. 
And it's fantastic to see how these graduates are really and truly paying it forward. Now, over the past probably five years, um, I've been started getting involved with building capacity and biostatistics, and I made Prahanu promise not to ask me a stats question in front of everybody tonight. <laughs> but we, uh, we started realizing the need because there's not enough biostatisticians in the region. And there was a lot of talk uh, um, in the early, uh, in 2011, 2012, that there needs to be more biostatisticians. So we then hosted a meeting in 2014 where, where we actually decided it's about taking action. And from that meeting, we spent some time to define the competencies of a biostatistician. And we planned for a master's program in biostatistics. Um, we were then also successful in, in getting a big grant from the NIH, Fogarty, to support the implementation of the program. And it's really great to reflect that we now have three cohorts of students completing the Masters in Biostats. And I'm really delighted to see some of them in the audience. We already had our first cohort of graduates. Um, and we are now hoping to have five more graduating early in next year. And they are moving on. They are being immediately being sucked up by opportunities or advancing their further studies with PhDs. So in terms of reflecting on this, uh, my involvement with research um, up until now, I think it's important that we conduct our research on relevant questions. I think it's very important that we take stock of existing research to inform new research, and we're not doing enough of that. We need the right team, and we need to support the teams to doing it well. And I think it's really important that we invest in the next generation, because they are the ones that will take it forward. But now if we think about achieving improved health and health care as an outcome, when we talk about research, it's really only one of the outputs towards that outcome. And there's a whole lot more that you need to do beyond publishing your research in a fancy peer-reviewed journal, uh, journal and, and sharing it only with researchers. So I want to move on and just share with you a bit around my experiences with evidence translation, um, which is often referred to as this no-do gap. So we have the research, we know what works or doesn't work, but then applying what works in, in policy and practice doesn't always happen. And so we need strategies to bridge this gap between what we know and what we do. And I'm again starting with my experience with the Cochrane Center at the MRC. In 2005, um, we launched the project called the Supporting the Translation of Evidence into Policy and Practice, or in short, the STEP project. And what we did is we actually worked with sub-national policymakers. We took existing policies and we identified some key questions from those policies. And then we went to have a look and see, so, so wh what's the evidence base for these particular questions? And then we found existing research and we write this really nice, we wrote this really nice summary of the evidence. So what is known about benefits, what is known about harms, what's known about feasibility or applicability issues. And the one page document we provided back to the decision makers. And sometimes they loved what we were doing and sometimes they didn't want to hear what we found. And that was because if we affirmed what was in the policy, it was great. But if we went against it, they were not so happy with what we were doing. So some people were saying we're stepping on toes. But we thought it's really a step in the right direction. <laughs> so about nine, ten years later, uh, in my work at the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare, we started with a different initiative called the Policy Buddies Initiative. Um, and through this particular initiative, we first had some uh, research that we did with them to find out what will influence the uptake of evidence in decision-making. 
Uh, we then ran some workshops for them to identify what was their questions and also to build their own capacity in understanding research and where to find research. But importantly, based on those questions, we then had a buddy model where we linked one of our team members, a researcher, with a policy maker for them to work together so that they can have this engagement with one another, build a relationship with the hope that it will increase the demand for evidence. Um, in terms of our evaluation, I really like this one quote that I will read to you. We don't have their capacity or skills and they don't have ours. This linkage is key to make the process smoother. And our evaluation after about eight months actually showed that there was increased relationships between the researchers and the policy makers that were buddied. And furthermore, that there was an increased demand for evidence and actually a response to provide evidence. So based on, on the reflection linked to, to evidence translation, I think for me, one of the key things is that the research output alone is not enough to influence policy. Um, we need to be mindful that this whole process of getting evidence into policy uh, is influenced by a lot of factors. Um, and that interpersonal relationships and communication between the research users and producers can really increase the demand for evidence and the use for evidence. Looking at researchers themselves, it's really important that we also understand the policymaker environment so that we don't feel it's a them versus us scenario. And importantly, we need to know that we, if we want to build relationships, we need to make time to do it. Because to build a good relationship, you need to foster it. And it can't be something you do as the last five minutes of your day to, to just touch base with somebody. Moving forward, if we want to improve health, however, we need to keep in mind that just having a perfect policy is not going to make a difference. But you need to implement that policy. So if your policy is evidence-informed, the next step is to make sure that that policy is being implemented. And within the healthcare system, there are various factors to consider when we talk about implementation. This is just one uh, graphic trying to represent the various layers that one needs to consider from leadership and governance through to HR, through to information and research, as well as service delivery issues. But I think you will all agree with me that at the backbone for a health system would be its human resources. So what I want to share with you is just an example of how I've been involved in building capacity for, in terms of human resources for health. This, what I'm showing to you, is an extract from uh, the Sicily Statement on Evidence-Based Practice. And I'll just read for you the little bit that I've underlined. Um, but I put forward, and this was in 2005, so it's not something from last year, this is quite a, like 14 years ago, that providing evidence-based care is recognized as a key skill for healthcare workers from diverse professions and cultures. The ability to deliver evidence-based practice promotes individualization of care and assures the quality of healthcare for patients today as well as those of tomorrow. So it's recognized internationally that all healthcare workers should be able to practice in an evidence-informed way. And linked to that, there's been recommendations that evidence-based practice and the competencies to be able to do that needs to be a core component of the curriculum for all healthcare professions. And it's linked to this that it led me to my PhD topic, which I spent a number of years on. <laughs> and the PhD was all set up to develop a best practice model for teaching and learning of evidence-based healthcare at Stellenbosch University. So we were trying to look at the evidence for teaching evidence-based practice and how best to do that. 
So that was a, a great journey because we, we met a, a, a lot of people along the way, a lot of collaborators. It opened the door for some new experiences. Um, and what was wonderful is that besides being able to share the findings within the university, we could also implement the findings um, and actually start changing the way we facilitate learning of evidence-based practices. So part of the SEMEPI project, which stands for Stellenbosch University Rural Medical Education Partnership Initiatives, was one of those mouthfuls <laughs> of a project. That was a great project where we work collaboratively with others fostering learning in public health, uh, in health systems, in infection prevention and control, as well as evidence-based health care. And we could actually use the findings from the research that we were generating to change the way we were facilitating learning for undergraduate students at Stellenbosch University. And as part of the process, we were also involved in training quite a number of trainers as well. And we're furthering this at the moment, many of those in the audience are involved with the, what we call the renewed MBCHB curriculum, where we're also trying to build what we've learned into that renewed curriculum. So a short reflection linked to implementation. I just want to acknowledge that, that to implement care is complex. The context one needs to consider and always be mindful of. It's important that we invest in advancing knowledge and skills of our healthcare workforce. It's important that we have joint and multi-pronged initiatives. And I think ultimately it's about fostering critical thinking and that's critical thinking amongst all of us, whether it's the healthcare worker, whether it's the patient receiving the care, whether it's the policy makers or the managers that's planning the care. So I'm actually doing very well for time, <laughs> but I've got a few more slides. So, so in conclusion, the one, some of the things that I want to highlight is that all of the actors that I spoke about earlier on um, are, are, are working towards the same common goal. We all want to improve health and health equity. Yet these actors, whether it's the researchers, the implementers, the policy makers, we don't always play nicely together. There's often mistrust and unnecessary competition, which also results into unnecessary duplication of efforts. And I think we're missing a step by not collaborating more um, with one another. So I, I think in terms of partnerships and collaboration, we can be linking amongst the researchers, between the researchers and implementers, between the researchers and policy makers, and there's so many different combinations. But importantly, as we're doing that, we are sharing best practices. We are able to work together um, and we can reduce unnecessary fragmentation and duplication in what we're doing. So I think we need to find more opportunities to be working together and working together better. So the, this slide is specific for Prof. Chikta that's sitting right in front. I think for those of you who know Prof. Chikta, if you get him in the passage, he will ask you about your publications, your profile, <laughs> whether you've done your PhD. Uh, so he, he gives you the P talk. So I was thinking, so I can't use the P's, I must use something else. So in summary, for me, I'm going to use the C's project. Huh? So if you want to influence the, the evidence ecosystem, I think it's important that we cultivate critical thinkers and lifelong learners. We all need to stay in touch with our five-year-old selves, where we never settle for, uh, for a quick uh, answer to when we ask why. So we need to foster critical thinking. We need to invest into capacity development of our champions, the advocates, those who's going to move forward and, and pay it forward. We need to conduct relevant and rigorous research. So where we do research, we need to do it well. Because we want that research to influence policy and practices and to have an impact in healthcare. 
And importantly, if we want to do that, we need to make sure that we communicate our research. We can't just finish the research and get it published. We need to communicate and go that extra st step. As researchers and academics, we must see how we can contribute to implementation so that we can have that next step. And there's a whole field linked to implementation research that is waiting for more activities to be happening. And importantly, that will have to be with researchers again working with implementers to answer relevant questions linked to implementation. But I think most importantly, we need to collaborate. We need to be building equitable and long-term partnerships so that we can work together to go further. So those are some of the key things that I need to consider, that I think we need to consider. So the Liverpool fans will say you'll never walk alone. And I think the important thing to keep in mind is on this journey, and for me on this journey that I've been, it's a truly the case that I wasn't walking alone. And I would like to acknowledge a, a number of people, so if you can just bear with me. I think importantly, I want to acknowledge my team within the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare. Um, they have truly been the best team to be working with. We work hard together and we play hard together. And we cry together. But I think importantly, their achievements, uh, the achievements of the center is made possible by this team. So I would like to ask the audience to help me in giving a round of applause to my team. to move on in terms of a special thing thanks to my mentors and my supervisors um, I will never forget my first research project that I completed and Prof Johnny Myers from UCT was my supervisor and I was shattered when I opened my draft that I thought was near final and there was not a single color besides red because he enjoyed doing his track changes and I think that stayed with me for a long time, that one needs to be open to feedback. <laughs> and it's not a personal attack on me, but it's something to get me to move forward. So starting with Johnny, I really want to acknowledge all of my mentors, Johnny Myers, Jimmy Farming, Sally Green, Mike Clark, Prof Chikta, and there's been many others that's been playing important roles in my journey up until now. Importantly, I want to say thank you to all my colleagues and my collaborators. Um, it's truly been a fantastic journey to have all of these collaborative projects and you can't get it done unless we all play to our strengths and we work well together. Uh, so that's uh, been, been a, a great support from all of them. I want to say special thanks to everybody behind the scenes. There are so many people within this faculty just as a start that's behind the scenes, those in the grants office, the administration, the security at the boom that waves and smile at me every morning when I come through. Uncle Dan that wish you have a lovely day when you come into the clinical building. The postgraduate office, human resources, we rely on all of them to make everything else go smoother. So for me, a warm thank you to all of them. I would like to thank faculty leadership for their support, um, for, for being there to, to hear when we come up with new ideas and new uh, suggestions for how we can restructure and organize ourselves or collaborate and work together. So it's really been fantastic to have that support from faculty leadership. But most importantly, I want to thank my family and my friends. I want to thank these beautiful ladies that you see there on the, uh, on the left hand side. That's my mom and the sisters. And I want to thank my aunts for their love, their caring nature and for always being there. And then I want to thank my two closest friends and both of them are in the audience, Clotilde and Heidi. They're always ready to take me on a boss parade. <laughs> you guys rock. 
I want to thank Dion, Gareth, Scott and Melissa for their support for our adventures, for always making me laugh. I've been zip lining. I can reverse down a rapid on the Orange River. I can show anybody how to do that sometime. And for sharing every moment with me. It's incredible to have you in my life. Then I need to thank my parents for their love and the foundation that they provided for the pearls of wisdom and for the best gift that they could have given me, which is a wonderful education. But I need to single one person out, and that's my mom. She is my, has been my inspiration, my best friend, my role model. And I know she's doing the night shift with the angels, but I miss her every day. But I do know that she lives in what I do. So no presentation of mine would be complete without quoting my favorite Tata. So I'm going to change his words a little bit tonight, if you can bear with me. And he said, I have walked this long road to influence the evidence ecosystem. That's my words. I have tried not to falter, and I have made missteps along the way. But I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I have taken a moment here to rest to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me and to look back on the distance I have come. But I can rest for a moment, for with this goal of advancing evidence-informed healthcare comes a lot of responsibilities and I dare not linger because my long walk is not yet ended. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, Professor Young and your family and your friends, Professor Vormink, Professor Blitz. Professor Gay van Pitius, Professor Chikta. Uh, may I ask, ladies and gentlemen, that we put our hands together once more for a wonderful inaugural lecture. It's, it's my great pleasure to be able to say a few words on behalf of the university at this auspicious occasion. An inaugural lecture is a milestone in an academic career, and it is a very happy milestone. As a university, we share in the joy of the occasion, and we honor a colleague who has achieved the highest of academic ranks. On such an occasion, a professor can look back on a substantial body of impactful research, and, and we heard Professor, describe, uh, professor Young describe this as where we have been. And we heard her unlock this for the rest of us who are not specialists in the field, but who yearn to know what she has been working on uh, all of these years. Uh, and she did that this evening with consummate skill um, on the very important topic of, of the evidence ecosystem. In our information-rich world, it is critically important to learn when data becomes information and when that information becomes evidence, and when it is evidence, how strong that evidence is. These are serious matters in all fields, but they are matters of life and death in public health. We heard about the fascinating three dimensions of this ecosystem, the creation of, of evidence, the translation thereof, and the synthesis thereof, and how this has played a role in the career of Professor Young. Um, she referred to the program that she created to help novice authors with systematic reviews. And ladies and gentlemen, this is also how I met Professor Young a few years ago. Um, a PhD student was badly lost in the faculty where I worked uh, in an interdisciplinary thesis on health economics. And that strayed into a systematic review, but without adequate training. And so I came here 
to Tigerberg, to see Professor Young, to ask her for help. Um, now, uh, this student was in deep trouble, and I can tell you it is not the best time to get involved in a dissertation when the dissertation is already at this point where the dean interve intervenes and removes the supervisor and appoints a new set of, a new set of uh, supervisors and reaches across faculty boundaries for even more assistance. But uh, she agreed immediately. It helped the student, not just with her academic work, but also in the deep personal crisis that she was in with her work. And, and I think you will uh, agree, colleagues, that she has done this for many students across the years. And so I'm very grateful for that, uh, Taryn. We heard how you, how you started the creation, or how you started the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare and the astonishing number of publications that have flowed from that. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we heard about the emphasis on translating that evidence into actual policy implementation, the knowledge or the no-do gap, as you called it. Um, I know Professor Chichter will like it if I refer to Marx this evening, um, who encouraged us not just to try to understand the world, but to say that our challenge is indeed to change the world. Um, and that is the challenge that we grapple with in this, in this no-do gap. And it is a, it is a, a terribly difficult uh, challenge. I really uh, uh, identified um, with the difficulties that she identified in the policy discussion. Um, the Buddies program is a brilliant idea, which I'm taking home to my fellow economists uh, to explain uh, how the colleagues in public health are, are building relationships with policymakers. Um, my master, Adam Smith, uh, advised us to understand that policymakers and politicians are only people. Um, and we mustn't think of them as neutral, disinterested, and all-knowing policy implementers. But we must understand that they are people and work with them as people. And that is what we saw this evening, a real humanity in the approach that you take to policy understanding and policy implementation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, an, an inaugural lecture is not just about where we have been. It is crucially about the future of the scholarship of the professor. In fact, the augur in inaugural refers precisely to the divining of the future that Roman priests used to do by looking at the flight of birds or the pattern of the entrails of, this, of the just recently slaughtered animal before the battle. I'm very glad to say that our standards of evidence have risen so much <laughs> over the last 2,000 years. And we have here one of the scholars who are responsible for it and who will take evidence-based healthcare into the future for not just better health outcomes, but more equitable health outcomes. And I want, to, uh, I, I want to ask you to join me as we put our hands together and celebrate one of our brilliant colleagues. Thank you, Professor Duplessis. Um, Colleagues, one of my first encounters with evidence-based medicine and critical thinking in medicine was as a seven-year-old uh, boy having been forced to drink Engels' soot. I'm not sure what's that in English. <laughs> uh, terrible stuff. Uh, my parents uh, thought my blood needed cleansing. <laughs> and I inquired about the evidence for this, and uh, they said, no, if it was good enough for your grandparents and it's good enough for us, it's good enough for you. So, um, but you know, uh, Professor Duplessis is, is very, um, uh, you know, is very uh, correct in saying that we've never been in a time with more information around, more information at the click of a button, um, but also never been probably in a time with more information that is false, um, that is uh, untrue, and that is deceiving, and that is not uh, based on any evidence. And so, uh, in terms of medicine, that's of course a, a big problem. And um, uh, you know, medical information has obviously also never been shared as easily as it is today, and medical disinformation has never been shared as easily as it is today. So, very important critical work that uh, that is done uh, within this division. As vice dean of research, I'm also very happy 
with the work that Taryn has done with the MBCHB curriculum renewal uh, program in terms of bringing in research and research evidence and um, all of those uh, factors into a new curriculum going forward. So thank you very much for all of that from my side. So colleagues and friends, all that remains for me is to thank everyone involved in this evening. As you know, uh, uh, evening like this is, is not uh, done by the flick of a button. It's a lot of work and requires planning and hard work. I'd like to express our gratitude to the whole team, especially the members of Marketing Communications, um, Megan Salon and uh, everyone else from the team, Mr. Manwin Sambu for the uh, audiovisual assistant, Justin Alberts for the videography of tonight's lecture, and everyone else who contributed to making this a wonderful evening. So with this, I declare these proceedings closed. I would like you uh, to, uh, or to invite you all to, um, uh, to some light refreshments outside, downstairs again in the foyer. And thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the evening and drive safely. Thank you very much. <laughs>